All right, welcome to our next lecture concerning the Renaissance. Um, in this segment, we're going to be focusing on early Renaissance painting. Um, in our last lecture, it was more of a sort of prototype for the Renaissance. Um, the main artist that we discussed was Giotto, who really ushered in um, a new sort of modern sensibility in painting and composition and, and a return to classical stylistic conventions that inspired um, many of the great artists um, during the Renaissance period that we're going to be looking at. Um, we're dividing the Renaissance into early um, high Renaissance and, um, and then some later stylistic um, conventions um, like mannerism um, in our um, bigger unit of um, the Renaissance as a whole. A whole. We're going to be traveling to a church, um, Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Um, Florence really is considered sort of the birthplace of um, the Italian Renaissance. One artist that we are going to be studying is Masaccio. Um, and this is an altar painting or altar piece that, um, that's above um, the altar in the church that we're going to be studying. Masaccio is incredibly important. He was the first painter in the Renaissance to incorporate the discovery of linear perspective into his art. This was discovered by, by Brunelleschi, who was an architect that we'll study in our next segment related to Renaissance architecture and sculpture. Um, if you look closely at the painting, um, you can really um, see this idea of this sort of one-point linear perspective that he's incorporating. If you've taken, you know, Art 1 with Mr. Kimple, um, you draw the hallway, and, and you, you probably understand sort of the technical aspects of, of this type of um, drawing. And it's scientific, it's, um, it's illusionistic, and again, it, it, it signals this return to imitation of life and, and drawing things in an illusionistic, naturalistic way. When we look closer at the diagram, um, these lines are called orthogonals. Um, they can be seen in the edge of the coffers. Um, notice, um, again, this is very much um, sort of this kind of Greek um, Roman architecture. This mimics a sort of triumphal arch, and then we have this coffering um, that we saw in um, some of the early um, Greek and Roman temples, uh, especially in the dome of um, the Pantheon. And um, it creates these diagonal lines that appear to recede in the distance. Um, because Masaccio painted from a low viewpoint, you have to, to think about this. Um, you know, the viewer would be, be standing much lower. Um, and he's, he's doing this on purpose so that it seems as if the viewer is looking up at Christ. Um, and so we're able to see the orthogonals in the ceiling. Um, and then he traces the vanish point um, to the ledge where the two donors um, of this um, painting um, sit. Um, so in painting, this is really one of the first um, uses of sort of scientific linear perspective, and, and that's why Masaccio is so important. The bottom part of the painting was um, not known to art historians. It was covered up for a long time, so they didn't realize it existed. Um, there was a flood in 1960 that revealed it, um, and for some reason that bottom part had been washed over. Um, if, you, if you look, you can see a skeleton, and um, in the panel um, it reads, and I'll give you the translation, I was... I was um, once what you are, you will be what I am. And we'll talk about the significance of this. Here's a closer look at um, the, the painting. So it's depicting the Holy Trinity. Um, the idea of the Holy Trinity is, you know, Jesus, who is the Son of God. We have God and then the, the Holy Ghost. Um, and this is sort of a concept that um, grew out of um, Catholicism. Getting back to this idea of one-point perspective, Mas Masaccio depicts the coffered ceiling of a barrel vault. So again, this is a Romanesque or Roman-style um, architecture. Um, this combined with one-point perspective gives, um, gives this sort of 
sense of incredible, realistic, illusionistic space. It's almost as if we um, are sort of standing um, in front of these donors and that we could step up and we could actually walk through this barrel vault. So this was an incredible um, sort of modern um, type of painting that really hadn't been explored or seen before. Um, it's a modest commission, and so again, this was commissioned by the two donors. Often we'll look at some paintings, um, and the and donors will be sort of depicted off to the side, sort of, you know, um, incorporated into the composition. Um, and so it, it's interesting because instead of, you know, dedicating a whole church or a chapel, um, like we saw with um, Scrivagini and, and Giotto's Arena Chapel, where he did all those beautiful frescoes, since they couldn't afford to, you know, donate something like that, um, but instead, you know, do this painting, again, this use of one-point perspective gives the illusion of of this sort of apse and this architecture and that, you know, and so it, it, it really functions um, in a cool way like that. So it's a modest commission. The patron could not afford to build the chapel, but painting, um, but the painting that they are donating gives the illusion of one. So again, um, the painting is depicting the three-part nature of God, the Holy Trinity. On the top, we have God the Father, so you can see here. Um, the dove, or the Holy Spirit, is kind of hidden. This is kind of a cool detail. It actually looks like, like sort of the collar um, of the God, um, the Father. And then, obviously, we have the Christ, um, Son of God. Um, some other things to note um, is the torture depiction of Jesus' body. Um, again, this return to anatomically correct detail. Um, we can see the pulling of muscles. He has a hollowed out abdomen. And this also um, taps into our emotional aspect as well, where um, we do feel empathy um, for, for the figure. Um, there's an emotional aspect as well, where you have the figure of Mary um, right here, and she's gesturing to Christ. And this is her way of suggesting that this is our path to salvation. And so there's a combination of Mary's deep faith with this scientific observation in the depiction uh, in this depiction of both illusionistic space and anatomy. So again, it's important for you to remember that we're thinking about these Christian themes and ideas, but now it's, you know, it's being incorporated with science and, and sort of these sort of scientific discoveries, um, which is quite exciting and one of the, I think, sort of defining characteristics of the Renaissance. Um, over here is the figure of St. John, and he is more of a devotional figure or a kind of prayer figure than a narrative figure um, like Mary um, is serving. Um, again, the donors I talked about earlier are depicted outside of the sacred space. So again, it's like they're depicted, um, you know, outside of, of what, you know, the sacred event that's taking place. Um, all figures incorporate modeling and shading to make the you know the figures seem three dimensional. So again, this this really huge shift away from this um, you know early Christian Byzantine medieval way of depicting the human form, um, you know moving away from these sort of flat linear uh, you know depictions and moving back towards this um, classical Greco-Roman attention to the human body and, and this sort of naturalism of it. Again, um, also, you know, incorporating some some pagan um, architecture, like um, the Roman um, triumphal arch. Um, also, we talked a lot about civic identity and pride, and so, again, one of the things that you'll notice um, is, you know, the city's identity, such as Florence, um, is really important. Um, Florence was a culture of trade. Um, it had to be analytical in conducting their business and trade. And so a lot of or art historians think that Masaccio's art is responding um, to this with um, this combination of scientific observation and emotional appeal. We're going to focus on the bottom portion now. Um, and again, it represents um, or it's a depiction of a skeleton. Again, the use of this sort of illusionistic space where the skeleton um, on the altar um, seems to project into our space. 
Masaccio is deliberately offering two points of view, and then with the quote, as I am now, you shall be as you are now, so once was I, and this is, um, the, trans this is the inscription, I translated it for you. Um, and, and this is really signaling that the, I, the idea that death is inevitable and, and that we should not take life for granted um, and that we really should start preparing now for our, our salvation so that um, we can have an eternal life. Looking back at the composition as a whole, um, we see that Christ is depicted above the skeleton. Um, depictions of skeletons are often um, referenced as memento mori. That's spelled M-E-M-E-N-T-O-M-O-R-I, which is a reminder of death. The message conveyed is that if you do not emulate what is above, you know, Jesus and, and his salvation and, and his sacrifice to us, you will end up as a skeleton below. And so there's this growing notion of humanism, and that was one of your vocabulary terms that I gave out, the idea that man can observe and understand the science and physics of his world, but can do so in the service of God. We're going to look at another one of Masaccio's um, frescoes, again located in another church. Um, this is located in the Branchi Chapel. Um, um, in Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence. Um, it dates 1427. Um, the Brace Chapel has a U-shaped floor plan. In the 1770s, there was, a, there was a fire and soot had blackened and darkened uh, the figures um, in the frescoes that are depicted here. It's really interesting because for years, art history books had discussed the frescoes of this church, apparently thinking these were the colors and tones Masaccio had originally used. Um, when the frescoes were eventually cleaned, historians realized the beautiful, brilliant palette Masaccio had used um, in his uh, original um, frescoes, and so uh, art history books had to be re rewritten concerning um, his work. And so, um, again, if you can imagine, you know, how like smoke and, and just accumulation of, of dirt and, and obviously the smoke of the fire had darkened and made these images look very dingy. And then once they cleaned them, how brilliant the colors were. Um, and again, color is in a really important formal aspect when we're talking about art. And so if this had a, a darker palette or seemed more muted or grimy, obviously, um, you know, we look at this and interpret it differently with this more jeweled, bright um, um, color palette. Here's a close-up. So these frescoes depict the life of St. Peter, um, except for this expulsion scene right here, um, which is an Old Testament scene, the expulsion of Adam and Eve. Again, um, probably an example of prefiguration. Um, prefigure prefiguration. Uh, and um, we are going to talk about the, the depiction of Adam and Eve. Um, so it is a depiction of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Eden um, again, referencing sort of classical or return to classical stylistic conventions. You can really um, see um, a return to depicting the nude fi figure. Um, we haven't seen that in a while. So we have the, the female nude and the male nude. Remember with... Um, you know, medieval um, art, um, the nude body was, was considered shameful. Um, you can really see the depth uh, of grief as well in Eve's face, and it, it almost looks very mask-like, and it's almost like this mask of grief. In contrast, um, Adam is so upset and shameful, he cannot show his face, so he has his face um, covered. And this again relates back to Giotto. Remember, he was very good in terms of compositionally um, doing these sort of contrasts uh, um, here, you know, this revealing the face, hiding the face. Um, and, and Giotto did something very similar, this sort of um, comparison and, and of contrasts or composition of contrasts. Um, notice the cast shadow coming from the figures. Um, this is, again, realistic, paying attention to how light would actually reflect off a body um, and, and these, these sort of scientific phenomena that happen. Um, this is also signaling that they are now mortal. They're being, ex, you know, ex, 
um, thrown out of the Garden of Eden, and so now they're mortal and, and would cast a shadow. So remember, medieval figures would have never had cast shadows. Remember, medieval figures would be flat, they'd be kind of floating around in space, um, uh, and so this is again a very um, dramatic shift. Um, here again, I, I should have shown this earlier, referencing this return to um, classical Greek. This is from, I hope you remember, the Hellenistic, um, or no, sorry, the, the very high classical period. Um, and um, we have this depiction of the goddess Aphrodite. Um, she's also depicted as uh, more of a human mortal woman taking a bath. Um, and so there's some interesting comparisons I think you could make with, with these two pieces. So this fall from grace being depicted um, really makes Christ's coming a necessity and, and, and really fuels this idea of the first church that St. Peter will found. Um, so that's why it's important to include this, this scene. This, and again, this sort of it prefigures um, uh, the depiction of some of the frescoes we're going to look at next, um, depicting St. Peter, who was the founder of the first church. So again, some things to note, contrast of emotions, Adam's grief is more internal, um, his face is covered, but his body is exposed, Eve's grief is more external, um, her body is covered and her face is exposed. Um, notice the reference to the modest Venus pose as well that we saw in ancient, um, in ancient um, Greek sculpture. You know, we, we talked about this, um, this sort of pose of modesty, but also sort of accentuates her sensuality as well. Um, now I'm showing you a comparison of, um, of, of the expulsion scene compared to Giotto's, um, one of the um, narrative scenes depicting the life of St. Mary from the um, Arena Chapel. Um, Note um, over here with Masaccio's um, expulsion, we see um, these black rays. Again, this was done with silver at the time, and so they've oxidized over time. Masaccio employs modeling and shading to give figures a more three-dimensional feel. And again, this is probably very much inspired by the work of um, the earlier work of Giotto. Um, there is an attempt to portray canonical proportions, but again, they're a little bit awkward. He's not quite there. Um, you know, Adam's um, torso is a little strange. His legs are a little bit too long. But again, this really signals this, this shift of looking um, at the human figure and, and trying to imitate nature. There's um, demonstrates the use of foreshortening. We talked about that with Giotto and sort of the tilting of the heads. Um, um, and sort of depicting figures at angles. And then he also experiments with architecture in a similar way to Giotto, where um, he's sort of using um, the architecture as a stage, almost to sort of have these um, events or scenes play out. And again, they almost look like sort of like dollhouse architecture. All right, so we're going to look, um, we're, we just finished the expulsion scene, and we're going to look over here to Masaccio's um, depictions of um, a story called The Tribute Money involving um, St. Peter, who was the founder of the first church. Um, this is a rare story involving a, a Jewish law that all strangers passing among the Jews should pay the priests of the temple and offer an offer um, to the Lord. Um, you know this this tribute and it was it was called the tribute money and that's what it was referred to and so um, this story is depicting um, Jesus being asked um, to make this tribute um, so um, when we look at the composition we see the depiction of multiple views of, of Peter um, he's depicted over here He's depicted over here with Jesus, and then he's depicted over here trying to get a coin out of um, the mouth of a fish. Um, and, but, and this is, you know, similar to some of the illuminated manuscripts that we looked at um, in terms of the arrangement. Um, 
um, from the medieval period. Um, this is an earlier illuminated, illuminated manuscript that we, we studied from um, the Byzantine area, era, the Vienna Genesis, Rebecca at the Well. Um, so you can sort of see this idea of a narrative and these, you know, this depiction of multiple viewpoints where you have Rebecca um, depicted um, in various scenes. Um, you know, this idea of multiple perspectives um, throughout the composition. Um, the artist had to remember sort of curve um, this sort of um, very linear in the sense of you know, long composition that was very reminiscent of a, a architectural frieze from a temple um, and fitted onto this page or this illuminated, of this illuminated manuscript. But I think you can see some similarities here, although now um, there's a return to realism. Here the figures are very, very medieval. Um, you know, and not anatomically correct, very stylized. There's a definite loss and um, no attention paid to illusionistic space. So here we're, we're, we've returned to Masaccio's tribute money. So hopefully you can see sort of some similarities um, with those two. Um, but it's different in that definitely um, in addition, in a similar ways where they have this sort of um, similarity with these multiple views of the of the main figure in this case Peter, um, it's organized through linear perspectives. So there's a, there's this sense of um, illusionistic space. Um, there's also an incorporation of something called atmospheric perspective. Um, this is another one of your vocabulary terms where things seem to um, you know as we look at something in the distance it gets foggier and hazier. And so he's, he's, that's another scientific um, phenomenon. And so that's being incorporated into um, this composition, which is depicting a Christian story. Um, he uses architecture to focus and organize the scene. Very, again, again, very similar to the work of Giotto, um, where Peter is paying the tax collector. You can see over here. Um, and he also sort of does this blocking technique where he uses the orange figure standing in contrapposto. Again, another classical stylistic convention. And the back of the figure, again, to sort of um, focus our attention um, to, to specific parts of the composition, um, in particular what's happening here with Jesus. Um, he's wearing a short skirt, again, contrasting to the other figures where they're draped in these long cloaks. Um, so again, very similar to, to Giotto. Um, here's a detail of it as well. Um, there's an interesting combination of medieval symbols being translated into Renaissance style as well. Um, note the halos. Um, we saw that with um, Byzantine art. But now they've been tilted. Um, and foreshortened. Um, so it's interesting, they're taking a sort of make-believe symbol or supernatural symbol um, and make, and you know, sort of suggesting how it would act in the real world. So the symbol of spirituality treated as if it's a physical solid object in the real world um, is very interesting. This detail depicts Jesus being confronted by a Roman tax collector. Um, Jesus has renounced all worldly possessions, so he has no money to pay taxes. He ends up directing St. Peter to pay the tax collector from the coins that come out of the fish's mouth. And so he's performing a miracle. And, and so that's what's happening here. He's directing Peter. Peter's kind of angry and offended that this tax collector would, would confront Jesus in this way. And Jesus is like, hey, no, relax, don't worry. Um, just, just go over to that fish and you'll get a coin out of his mouth. Um, and, you know, he performs this miracle. So why this subject matter? And that's something else you, you should be thinking about in terms of, you know, why artists choose or why patrons choose to have a certain um, scene depicted. Um, so Castado um, was a new form of tax or income tax the city of Florence was implementing. It's spelled C-A-T-S-T-A-D-O. Um, this program obviously was not very popular. So to instill the ideas, um, to in instill the idea showed that even, to instill this idea and to have a more positive outlook on, on this, um, this income tax, 
um, he's, you know, they're depicting this scene showing that even Jesus had to pay taxes. And again, this all goes back to civic identity and civic responsibility that, you know, if you're going to be part of a community, you, you need to help maintain it. And so, you know, a portion of your income or what you have should should be um, contributed to maintain um, the infrastructure of, of a city. Note the use of chiaroscuro. This is a, a, a you know this contrast and shading from light to dark, where the the drapery looks very modeled and three dimensional. We get a sense of bodies underneath the drapery. Again, a very Greek classical, Greco-Roman classical um, convention. Um, and there's a sculptural treatment of these figures, so they're definitely looking back to Greek and, and Roman sculpture. Um, and and then this is the last depiction. So in the scene itself, he's um, Masace is depicting um, three different moments in of time in one panel. So this is sort of the main panel where he's being confronted, um, and you know Jesus directs Saint Peter to go check the fish out. And this is Saint Peter getting the coins out of the fish's mouth, and then we have Saint Peter paying the tax collector. Um, when we look at this figure of St. Peter collecting the money from the mouth of the fish, again, this use of foreshortening, um, again, paying attention to imitating nature and an illusionistic space. Um, like Giotto, um, Masaccio unifies the space and, and but also organizes it through various compositional elements. Uh, we talked about the use of atmospheric perspective and, and linear perspective um, on the right side of the composition, uh, I'm sorry, where Christ is the vanishing point. Um, notice the cast shadows of the figures and objects um, in the, um, objects um, on the ground, this is again a uh, observation of realistic light and how it would actually function in the real world. Um, gestures and body languages of the figures really activate the composition. There's lots of pointing and looking and, and, and sort of this what I call a psychic line or a psychic gaze. Different facial expressions um, and you know this sort of depiction of individual um, features of, of um, the people represented. Um, and these are all things that Masaccio has incorporated and, and obviously um, Giotto um, that we looked at earlier inspired um, these conventions. The frescoes are interesting too because they they use the constant real source of light of the chapel and pretend that it's, it's light hitting the figures and objects in the scenes of the painting in a realistic way. Um, so this idea is that, you know, light coming from a window here, um, you know, it's, it's sort of entering, it's sort of becoming part of the painting and it's the actual light source in the painting and sort of reflecting um, in a similar way to as if these figures were standing in that light source. So again, this combination of religious themes um, combined with um, scientific observation. So... Right, we're going to stop here. Um, there is a part two, so stay tuned.